Okay, hello everyone. This is Colin Cox and this is Modern American Literature. Today I want to talk primarily about the Thomas Wolfe novella, The Lost Boy, and I'll say a little something about the William Faulkner story I asked you to read, A Rose for Emily, because I think both of these texts are engaging with this idea of narrators and, in particular, narrative unreliability. And that's perhaps another way of saying there's a whole body of scholarship, criticism, etc. about narrators, in particular narrators who perhaps we as the reader, for various reasons, cannot trust. And I'll say a little something about that, but the kernel of the idea that I really want you to think about is how in both of these texts, the main characters, so to speak, or, or the characters who seem to drive the narrative, more than anything in their absence, don't necessarily have an opportunity to narrate their own experiences. We get at these characters, or we get to these characters, through these other characters and through these other narrative voices. There's there's something mediating for us as readers. There's something mediating our experience with and our understanding of, again, maybe not the protagonists of each story, but definitely the characters in each story or the characters in each text that really drive the narrative. So I wanted to start today with Thomas Wolfe's The Lost Boy. And this is certainly an interesting and a lovely novella. And when I say novella, it's just a long story or a short novel. It fits in that middle space between the two. If you could just imagine a short story and how long a short story should be. And all of this, to be completely candid with you, is quite arbitrary. But just imagine how long you think a short story should be. And imagine how long you think a novel should be. A novella seems to fit between those two. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough. These distinctions are quite arbitrary. But one of the things I really like about Wolf, and one of the things I always like to think about with Wolf, is how he, like most writers, try to build these worlds within his stories or within his narratives. But for someone like Wolf, his worlds often, especially in The Lost Boy, feel quite speculative, which is to say there is perhaps something precarious about the worlds he builds. They don't always feel as stable and coherent as perhaps we want, or perhaps they're not as stable and coherent as we think of when we think of narrative worlds. And I think the reason why is simply because evocation, and I'll talk about that word in just a minute, but evocation matters more than form. Or that's another way of saying noise matters more than the world. And just to quickly summarize what I, what I think or what my take is, I think the feeling that Wolf tries to provoke or the feeling that he attempts to evoke in his narratives matters so much more than either the narrative worlds themselves or any real sense of narrative coherency, which is why there are parts of this story that feel like stream of consciousness, like someone's just rambling on quite incoherently. I think we see this in part two, for example, and maybe even a little bit in part three. There's something about those sections that feel maybe a bit unedited, they're a little raw, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But then we have parts one and four, which feel more like traditional or conventional narratives, but I'll talk about how this sense of loss, and we'll talk about this word a lot, because I think what I ultimately want you to consider or reckon with is what this word loss actually means. What does it mean for loss to define this story? What is lost? How, how do we think about a word like lost? Lost in what way? Lost how? And, and maybe more importantly, 
Lost in what? So I'll talk a lot about this word loss and this word lost and the the idea that I really want to grapple with. It's something of a contradiction or a contradictory idea is for someone like Wolf, the moment you find what you want or the moment you find what you are searching for is simultaneously and in a contradictory way the moment you lose it. So Wolf, again, this feels like something of a contradiction, but he wants to bundle finding and losing together in the same gesture. And I think we see that again quite visibly at the end of the story in part four. So why don't we just start with the first part and it's this third person narrative or or this section has third person narration and it offers us a picture of Robert, one of these children, one of these siblings who died prematurely and as you probably noticed the remainder of the narrative for the surviving family members, the mother, the sister, the brother, they attempt to understand who Richard was, who Richard continues to be, what he represents for this family, what he represents for these individuals. In particular, if you think about Robert's sister, the way she grapples with her culpability in his death. But the first part, again, it's it's it feels more perhaps detached, like a third person omniscient narrator. And we really see just the lives of Richard, excuse me, Robert and his father. And this section covers pages 808 through 815. And I think you could certainly argue that this is something of a slow meandering section. Wolf focuses quite closely on these minute details, which suggests the importance of, quote, the moment and the unchangeable nature of certain spaces. And I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But in particular, this focus on particular moments and how characters feel in particular moments and how Wolf even wants us as readers to feel in particular moments. And I think we see this on page 809, just the sorts of details that Wolf gives us of this environment. And I'm reading here on 809, it's around the middle of the page. So if you can, follow along with me. The square walked past him. Then, with steady steps, plumb, pulse, and fountain, and the sheeting spray, the open arches of the fire department doors, the wooden stomp of the great hooves, the casual, whisking of the dry coarse tails. He passed the fire trap of a wiener stand, and the singer shop, the steel bright smartness of the new machines with their swift evocations of the house the whir, the treadle, and the mountain hum, the vague monotony of woman's, excuse me, the vague monotony of women's work. He passed the music store, the coffin splendor of piano shapes, the deep-toned richness and the smell of proud dark wood, the stale yet pleasant memory of parlors. And then he continues on. We see a description of the grocery store, but all of this feels a bit mundane, perhaps, but it also seems important. And I think if you continue to read down that third paragraph, if you just look at that sequence of paragraphs, it's the one that begins with, he was going past the hardware store now. And there's language near the middle of that paragraph the certitude of this unchanging pattern set to the grand assurance of the everlasting square. And just focusing on a word like unchanging, because this is, again, a story about certainly how the world changes, but because the world does progress. We see this in sections two, three, and four. These, these characters, their lives continue, but they seem perhaps 
unmistakably and irrevocably focused on this moment in the past, on Robert as a, as a figure or a single character, someone who perhaps represents for this family this sense that they, they can't perhaps move beyond what he is and what he represents. So in many ways, Robert embodies this sense of un changing or or this this unchanging nature of the world because again so many members of his family fail or refuse to move beyond him or or leave him in the past they just remain so focused on him for better or for worse and when i began this lecture i said that robert is a lot like emily in the faulkner story because he is not necessarily afforded an opportunity to narrate his own experience, but here at the beginning of the story, Wolf affords us an opportunity to see and know Robert a little bit. We get a sense of this character, this character who has or possesses this outsized influence in his family, even though he is not afforded an opportunity to narrate his experience. Wolf does give us a picture of him. If you look, for example, on page 810, this is at the bottom of the page. I'll just read at least one, maybe two of these paragraphs. And yet he did not go away. He hung there curiously, peering through the window with his dark and gentle face now focused and intent, flattening his nose against the glass. Unconsciously, he scratched the thick-ribbed fabric of one stockinged leg with the scuffed toe of his old shoe. The fresh warm odor of the new-made fudge had reached him. It was delicious. It was a little maddening. Half-consciously, he began to fumble in one trouser pocket and pulled out his purse, a shabby, worn old black one with a twisted clasp. He opened it and prowled about inside. So I think what we see here, Wolf, I think Wolf is actually quite good at doing this. He's he's so good at just describing how children look and how children behave, that kind of, of controlled, chaotic energy. I think we see a little bit of that here. But Robert is a bit different because he seems to have or he seems like an observer of sorts. I think that's what's really interesting about Robert is the narrative gives us this sense that he's he's quite a thoughtful and attentive young person and even Wolf using a word like prowl to describe his behavior. I think you could do some interesting work just thinking through what a word like prowl ultimately means, but Wolf also gives us a picture of this father as well, this father figure who really just occupies this opening section of the story. He's not that significant at all for the remainder of the narrative. And we get a sense of him on 813. So if you would go to page 813, the man looked up and then returned to work. He was a man of 53, immensely long and tall and gaunt. He wore good dark clothes, save he had no coat. He worked in shirt sleeves with his vest on, a strong watch chain stretched across his vest, wing, collar, and black tie, Adam's apple, bony forehead, bony nose, light eyes, gray-green, undeep and cold, and somehow lonely looking. A striped apron going up around his shoulders and starched cuffs and in one hand a tremendous rounded wooden mallet like a butcher's bowl, and in his other hand, implacable and cold, the chisel. And then, of course, we hear him speak, how are you, son? So the appearance of this father is quite interesting. He possesses this degree of formality. I think we see this in his clothes. Wolf describes his collars as starched. He wears this tie, but he does the kind of work that we don't often associate with perhaps that level or, or that 
degree of refinement, which is what I actually like about this. I think Wolf is giving us a picture of the past that for a lot of us seems just so elusive. And what I also like about this, it gives us a clear sense of who his father really is. I think you could do some interesting analysis of the father figure in this novella. What do these descriptions of his clothing and of his perhaps demeanor, the way he holds his body, what does that suggest about this character? Are there even moments of contradiction here too? And if so, what are they? But I think these five or six pages, seven pages, they all lead to this moment of realization and recognition for Robert. And I think this is one of the moments early in the narrative where Wolf starts to develop this notion or this idea that I mentioned earlier about loss and gain happening, perhaps bundled together in the same gesture. And this is on page 815 near the top of the page. And light came and went and came again into the square, but now not quite the same as it had done before. He saw that pattern of familiar shapes and knew that they were just the same as they had always been. But something had gone out of that day, and something had come in again. Out of the vision of those quiet eyes, some brightness had been lost into their vision, some deeper color come. He could not pass, excuse me, he could not say, he did not know through what transforming shadows life had passed within that quarter hour. He only knew that something had been gained forever, something lost. So again, I'll return to this idea in particular near the end of the story about loss and gain how, again, for someone like Wolf, he wants to bundle all of that into the same moment or the same gesture. But the thing that I would just pause over here briefly and say, or perhaps just reiterate, is how this is perhaps as close as we get to an unmediated picture or understanding of Robert. And even then, I would, I would use a word like or a phrase like unmediated, I would place it in scare quotes because I still think there's a sense that because Robert isn't narrating his own experience, not that if he were narrating his own experience, that would constitute an unmediated, perhaps altercation or, or encounter for us as readers, but this is about as close as Wolf will get us to experiencing and encountering Robert in something that approximates unmediated, or this is as close as we get to an unmediated experience with, with Robert, because the remainder of the narrative, it feels like it's just an attempt to recapture what Wolf gives us here in the opening section or in this opening part something something close to who robert was this this image or this notion of robert perhaps encased in amber we have this sense that perhaps in their futility his family just continues to to search for what wolf gives us in this opening section or they or they do so in a in a rather futile way so from here on the very same page, and you'll notice this break because we have now transitioned into a different section. And I think the way Wolf reveals that to us or, or signals that to us is through the change in narrative perspective. Because now this is a first person narrative or, or this section, pages 815 through 818, this is Robert's mother. 30 years after Robert's death, and this almost feels like something of a dramatic monologue. So the tone of the story changes. The language, you'll notice, for example, first-person eyes instead of third-person he, she, they's. And it's important because this whole early modern or high modern period, and I spoke about this a little bit last week with figures like Fitzgerald and Hemingway, 
there was a lot of play with form, and I think you certainly see Wolf playing with form, perhaps in the way that Hemingway played with form, and it requires us as readers to pay very close attention and to be very attentive as we're reading to these sorts of perhaps shifts in narrative voice, narrative perspective, but she is, again, clearly a grieving figure, and I think we see this through her insistent repetition of the same ideas. And if you go, for example, to page pages 816 and 817, I think we get just a little taste of this. Look at the bottom of page 816, and I'll read over onto 817. Child, child, I've seen you all grow up, and all of you were bright enough, but for all around intelligence, judgment, and general ability, Robert surpassed the whole crowd. I've never seen his equal, and everyone who knew him as a child will say the same. So this is something the mother repeats several times in this section, but what's also interesting about this is this picture that Wolf gives us of what Robert has become to this family, because to the mother, 30 years after his death, she's really lionized him. She's canonized him in some way. You, you could even argue that this, this reputation of his, it doesn't quite match, perhaps, or it doesn't match the Robert that we saw in the opening section. And you could perhaps then ask yourself a series of questions. Well, why is that? Is this just a product of her grief? Is, is it possible that what we saw in the opening section wasn't a full, accurate representation of who Robert was? Is it perhaps a combination of the two? But I think what moments like this do, it just provokes us as readers to ask questions, and it provides another picture of who Robert was. Because what I think is really interesting about this story is how we don't have a single unified image of who Robert is. We, we really get just a series of impressions of who Robert is. None of them, once we reach the end of the story, none of them feel particularly stable or even true, yet there's also no sense that any of them are wrong. And I think, again, that's that's one of the interesting contradictions that Wolf grapples with. We never get who Robert actually is, but that's not to say that we don't get Robert in some way, and we as readers are just left to, to sit with that contradiction. But this final image that we get of Robert from this section is one of, of perhaps want and aspiration, which is to say, in his mother's eyes, Robert is a figure who always wanted more. If you go, for example, to page 818, this is right at the top of the page, and this is also the moment that ends section two. And when I think of Robert, as he was long about that time, I always see him sitting there, so grave and earnest-like, with his nose pressed to the window, as we went down through Indiana in the morning to the fair. And if you pay, for example, close attention to this idea of his nose pressed against the window, it might remind you of that passage that I read from section one, where Robert was looking longingly into that chocolate or, or candy shop. And, and I think the feeling we're meant to have or, or the, the sensation that Wolf evokes here is one of want and desire and even satisfaction that potentially Robert was, according to his mother, a character who was never fully satisfied Perhaps he was someone who always wanted more. He was always aspiring for more. And again, I think as readers, we can pause here for a moment and consider what this might say, perhaps not so much about Robert, even though I just mentioned how this moment might correlate with or might complement something we saw in section one, but more specifically, what this might say about the speaker herself. Because what I think is really interesting Wolf 
often writes the desires of the speakers, or in, in this case, let me rephrase, Wolf often writes the desires of the narrators, here at the mother, for example, into uh, the stories they tell about Robert. And that's another way of saying, perhaps it is questionable whether or not this is who Robert was, but thinking of Robert as a character who wanted more might say far more about the speaker and might say far more about what the mother ultimately wanted, a figure who continues to grieve the death of her son. She simply wanted more, and she has perhaps consciously or unconsciously mapped that desire onto her picture or her characterization of Robert. Now, from here, we transition to section three or part three. And this section or this part, pages 818 through 822, we have another limited first person narrator. And this is Robert's sister. And in this section, she, again, attempts to understand her culpability in Robert's death. And she, in effect, describes this moment when Robert got sick and how that led to his untimely death. And I would encourage you, again, notice the form this section takes, because the ellipses in this section is quite interesting. It suggests, perhaps, this is my reading, it suggests a sense of searching and a sense of uncertainty. Look, for example, at the bottom of page 819. They were all crazy about Robert. Everybody liked him. And how proud Robert was of you. Don't you remember how he used to show you off? How he used to take you around and make you talk to Billy Pelham? And Mr. Curtis at the desk. And how Robert would try to make you talk and get you to say Robert. And you couldn't pronounce the R. And you'd say, Wobbit. Have you forgotten that? You shouldn't forget that. Because you were a cute kid then. Ho, 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 ho. I don't know where it's gone to, but you were a big hit in those days. So again, just pay attention to the ellipses, all the pauses, and I would encourage you, you could do some interesting analysis here. What do you think this means? Why, why would Wolf include this? What does this say or suggest about this sister who is the narrator of this section? What does it say potentially about Robert, if anything? But what we also get in this section is just, quite frankly, this sense of hope lost. If you would, go to the bottom of page 821, and I'll read from here on to 822. I was thinking of it just the other day, and I wonder what Robert would say now if he could see that picture. For when you look at it, it all comes back, the boarding house, St. Louis, and the fair, and all of it is just the same as it has always been. Again, notice things remaining the same. As if it happened yesterday, and all of us have grown up and gone away, and nothing has turned out the way we thought it would, and all my hopes and dreams and big ambitions have come to nothing. So what's interesting here, maybe one potential way of reading this, again, you'll you'll see in a in a phrase or a construction like all of my hopes and dreams and big ambitions have come to nothing. That's another way of saying, here's what I've lost, or, or, or let's reckon with what I've lost. But just how, for this sister, Robert's death was something that sent her off or on a particular path. So for her, Robert's death is far less about what Robert was unable to become, like what we saw or what we see and what we hear in the second section that's narrated by the mother. And it's more about what she 
hasn't become. And I would encourage you to pause over this just for a second because I think maybe one way of reading this is to think, well, she's being selfish and solipsistic. But if you want to read it that way, I would love to hear about it, but I'll just offer an alternative reading or an alternate reading, one that suggests no Robert's death, to, to fully reckon with the trauma of his death, it's not enough to just reckon with what Robert lost. But I think what this section does, it invites us to think about, well, what has everyone else in this family lost? And, and if we are to grieve Robert's death, it's perhaps not enough to just grieve his life, to grieve a life lost, but we need to grieve all of these other lost lives. While their lives continued, the trajectory of those lives fundamentally changed after this particular moment with Robert, after this moment when he died prematurely. And I think you could argue Wolf really puts a pen in this, or he really punctuates this in an interesting way near the, near the end of this section, around the middle of page 822. The way it all turns out is nothing like the way we thought that it would be, and how it all gets lost until it seems that it has never happened. That it is something that we dreamed somewhere. You see what I mean now? That it is something that we hear somewhere, that it happened to someone else, and then it all comes back again. So, a word I would use, the word I would use, let me try again, the word I would use to perhaps describe this moment is a word like alienation and how alienated she feels. Again, alienated not just from her brother, her dead brother, her prematurely dead brother, but this sense of alienation from what her life could have become and even the past. She is in many ways a figure of alienation. But let's now transition to section four. So section four, this is, we've, we've again, here, we've encountered another first-person narrative, or we have first-person narration. And this is Robert's younger brother, Eugene, who's attempting to restore the past and his brother. And these pages, 822 through 827, and if we look, for example, on 825, there's an interesting passage here, again, where this notion of things remaining the same. Wolf, Wolf evokes this idea on 825. And it was just the same. The stairs, the hallway, and the sliding door. The window of stained glass upon the stairs, all of it was just the same except the stained light of absence in the afternoon and the child who sat there waiting on the stairs and something fading, like a dream, something coming, like a light, something going, passing, fading, like the shadows of a wood, and then it would be gone again, fading like cloud, shadows in the hills coming like the vast, the drowsy rumors of the distant, enchanted fair, and coming, going, coming, being found, and lost, possessed, and held, and never captured. Like lost voices in the mountains, long ago, like the dark eyes and the quiet face, the dark lost boy, my brother, who himself, like shadows, or like absence in the house, would come, would go, and would return again. So I think Wolf gives us here, if this story had a thesis statement, I think we're getting something quite close to the thesis statement of this story. Again, coming, going, it seems to be happening all at the exact same time. And we actually see Eugene experience this in an even more personal and affecting way on 827 when this memory of Robert trying to teach him how to say his name, it just, it just comes back to him, perhaps without his control. This is the top of 827. The years dropped off like fallen leaves. The face came back again. The soft, dark oval, the dark eyes, the soft brown, berry on the neck, the raven hair, all bending down, approaching. The whole ghost-wise intent and instant, like faces from a haunted wood. Now say it again, Robert. Wobbit. No, not Wobbit. Robert, say it. Wobbit. 
Oh, you didn't say it. You said Wobbit. Robert, say it. Now say it. Wobbit, look, I'll tell you what I'll do if you say it right. Would you like to go down to the King's Highway? Would you like Robert to set you up? All right, then. If you say Robert right, I'll take you to King's Highway and set you up to ice cream. Now say it right. Say Robert. Wobbit. Oh, you old tongue tie. That's what you are. Someday, I'm going to, well, come on now, then I'll set you up again. It all came back and faded and was lost again. I turned to go and thank the woman and I said goodbye. And obviously this moment is important and significant for Eugene because this is the moment when he found what was lost. But pay attention to what Wolf writes on 827. It all came back and faded. It was lost again. And he, he seems to emphasize this point even a little later down the page. Again, again, again. Notice the repetition. I turned into the street, finding the place where corners met, turning to look again, to see where time had gone. And all of it was just the same. It seemed that it had never changed since then, except all had been found and caught and captured for forever. And so, finding all, I knew all had been lost. So, Again, we're getting something close to a thesis statement. This is something I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture. The moment of discovery is for Wolf simultaneously the moment of loss. And I think another way of potentially framing this is to imagine that the finding triggers the loss in some way. And I know that's, that's something of a contradiction, right? You would think if you found something, how could you lose it? But I think what Wolf wants to get at is how in finding something, what you've lost is the fantasy associated with searching for the lost object. And that moment of finding, what actually happens in that moment is perhaps you realizing that you'll never find what you're ultimately searching for. And that's perhaps maybe another way to say that, is to say there is a difference between the object of desire and the object that causes desire. Because I think we often think that what we want, what we're searching for, even if we wanted to strip it down into really crude terms, like, I want this new cell phone. We think the object of desire, which is the cell phone, is the same thing as the object that causes our desire. And I don't think it's the same. I think there's something far bigger, far deeper, far more complicated and difficult to reconcile that actually drives us toward desiring things. And I think what Wolf is getting at here is how if, if what Eugene wanted was to, quote, find his brother, he was actually searching for something far deeper. And what he's confronting here is the recognition that what he wanted or what he was searching for was not actually the thing that was causing this search. Therefore, the finding is also the recognition of a kind of loss. And I think for someone like Wolf, there's perhaps no way out of this cycle. It's not like Eugene can recalibrate and and accurately or or effectively find Robert. Robert's just a representative figure or a symbol of an idea, something that's far more difficult to resolve and reconcile, but perhaps worth our time and worth our energy to think about 
and to grapple with, not just for this story, but perhaps for ourselves as individuals. So I'm at the 40 minute mark. I think I'll stop. I, again, hope you enjoyed this story. I know it's something of a challenging story, but I would say, even though I won't say a lot about A Rose for Emily, I think A Rose for Emily is quite similar in this way, that Emily represents for this community that wanted to understand her something elusive, unknowable. And again, like Robert, Emily is never really given an opportunity to speak for herself. Our experiences with Emily, much like our experiences with Robert, they're heavily mediated. And that's, that's perhaps something if you wanted to do, perhaps, or excuse me, if you wanted to write an essay about narrative perspective, narrative voice, how different narrative voices mediate our understanding or, or perhaps interfere with or get in the middle of our understanding of certain characters. I think the Fitzgerald story is a great example of this. I think this is yet another fantastic example of a text that would perhaps allow you to write that kind of essay or, or perhaps afford you an opportunity to think about those kinds of ideas. So, okay, with that said, this is Colin Cox for Modern American Literature. I hope you have a wonderful day.